which fields Europe and Eurasia can cooperate in future together? Well, first, there is no Eurasia at this point. Uh, there are many countries in that part of the world. Um, but the answer to your question, whoever those countries are, whatever they, uh, whatever relationships they will have uh, among them, I think it's very clear that uh, they, they can and will and actually do collaborate even today in the field of economics, in the field of uh, uh, human exchanges, in the field of uh, science and technology. Uh, but uh, in the field of uh, geopolitics, in the field of foreign affairs and security, um, frankly, I don't think there's um, um, a strategic actor in Europe who can uh, be um, a partner today uh, in, in, in those fields to the countries of Eurasia. For example, uh, Europe uh, have, uh, Europeans have a very strong economic relationship with China. But the Chinese view the Europeans essentially as a trading bloc. The Russians have uh, uh, very strong economic relations today with the Europeans, again, uh, despite the sanctions. But Europe as a single unit in terms of geopolitics does not exist in Russian eyes. So relations are very important. They're very intense in a few areas, but in some areas they're simply non-existent because the European Union is, uh, is, very, uh, is, a, is very much a creation sui generis, um, uh, it's, which is some way to an outsider between um, a federation and a trading bloc. And uh, there, there's only so much that you can do with, with such a partner in terms of uh, traditional foreign policy and geopolitics and security. Geopolitically, the European Union is not seen as a single actor. It is a very much a single actor in terms of economics and finance. I'm talking about the Eurozone, uh, but not in, 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 in geopolitics. The European Union doesn't have a common foreign policy, doesn't have a common security policy, a full-fledged security policy, doesn't have a, a defense policy, doesn't have a, a European army, so it's simply, though, though in those fields the Union is not, uh, is not an actor yet, or at least not an actor for now. Well, I, I think that the collaboration between China and Russia will continue more or less on the same principles as today, which is, uh, well, China uh, is, is a very important economic partner to Russia, second to the European Union, clearly, but in terms of, um, in terms of separate countries, uh, China is the largest trading partner for Russia. It's very different uh, from the Chinese viewpoint. Russia is, no, is, is nowhere near the top among China's uh, most important trading partners. Uh, geopolitically, the two countries have a lot of uh, common interest, globally and regionally. Uh, they have a few places where the interests uh, diverge uh, or are even uh, competitive, but Beijing and Moscow have found ways to manage those uh, differences and potential uh, crises in relations. Uh, I think that the uh, Sino-Russian relationship can be uh, termed to be a, a, a non-tant, which to me is, uh, is is somewhere between a uh, strategic partnership and an, al an, an alliance. I also think that the relationship is based on the principle that the two countries will never be against each other, but uh, that they will not necessarily be backing each other all the time. And that gives you uh, the assurance on the one hand that the other country will not turn against you, and uh, it gives you a lot of flexibility to do what you want to do and don't want to have your, your hands tied to those of your neighbor. Uh, there is uh, a lot of um, anti-Russian sentiment in the U.S. political class. Um, Russia has become a domestic political issue in the United States. Some of the areas where the United States and Russia uh, 
usually collaborated, such as arms control, are now being put on the back burner. Uh, the economic relationship between the two countries is negligible. In quite a few areas, the United States and Russia uh, are operating on different sides. Um, so I think that uh, even though Russia would want to have an improvement of the relationship on an equal level, uh, the United States, uh, the, the, the body politic of the United States sees Russia um, in much darker terms and sees Russia as inimical to the uh, principles of the United States, norms and uh, values, and they see, the, they see Russia as uh, undermining the uh, American global leadership. So to me that reduces very much the chances that the Trump administration will be able to advance very far on the Russia track. But my hope is that at least the relationship could be stabilized, that the United States and Russia will find a way to avoid a collision between the two countries, which I think uh, was uh, possible and getting ever more possible under the Obama administration, and that uh, the United States and Russia could find uh, a way to collaborate in the areas where they have interests uh, that are not inimical to each other. Uh, places like Syria, the Syrian political settlement, I think, is only possible if the United States is, uh, is giving support to the Russian efforts to uh, bring the situation to some sort of a political compromise. So I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful, uh, let's say, that, that, that something can improve, but I'm not looking uh, uh, at the relationship uh, as, uh, as, as, as something very promising. I don't think it will be. Well, I think he's, uh, he's called that predictable because, he, because of the way that he's, uh, he's entered the political scene of the United States, the way he first uh, uh, destroyed his... Um, his rivals in the Republican Party to snatch the nomination, the way he uh, demolished uh, Hillary Clinton and the Democratic Clinton political machine in the general election of the United States, the way he has been dealing with uh, the elites in the United States, the establishment, the media. So to a lot of people who are looking at various politicians, essentially is seeing them as uh, slight variations of one another. In fact, the difference between a Republican and a Democrat in the United States in the last uh, couple of uh, decades, maybe more, has been fairly small. Uh, Trump is, uh, is a far cry from your traditional Republican, not to speak of your traditional Democrat. So he, in that sense, he is, he is hard to read, and that's what people call unpredictable. He is unpredictable because people who look at him do not know enough about Trump, do not do not know enough, in my view, about the reasons, or do not understand very well the reasons that have brought Donald Trump to the White House in the first place. Well, I think that one of the reasons has been the neglect by the bulk of uh, American elites of important sections of, uh, of, of the American populace. Uh, the, if you like, the forgotten America of uh, uh, the middle classes who were, not, uh, who were not making much progress in the last uh, 30 or 40 years. My American uh, friends have been telling me that since uh, maybe the, the mid-70s or the late 70s, uh, the status of uh, people in the American middle class has not risen very much. And this is contrary to the American dream, where you have every new generation living substantially better than the previous generation. And at the same time, the elites, uh, many of them populating the, the, the East Coast and the West Coast of the United States, have uh, their, their, their fortunes, their position, uh, all that has skyrocketed. And there's this uh, imbalance within the country that has produced uh, the tension that uh, Donald Trump was able to see, was able to exploit, and that brought him to, uh, to the White House. It also has a cultural element. The people uh, in, in that America, in, in, in the America lying between the two coastlines, 
uh, many of those people espouse very different sets of values from the values of, let's say, New York or San Francisco. And that also counts. Well, to me, dialogue is, uh, is, is, is my modus operandi. I cannot function in a monologue mode. I can only function through dialogue. And through dialogue, I learn about things. Through dialogue, I learn about myself. Through dialogue, I can see why I'm wrong or where I need a little bit uh, more rethink. So dialogue, to me, is, uh, is absolutely uh, the uh, way to understand oneself, to understand other people, to understand the world.